Hi, everyone. Welcome. On behalf of the National Eczema Association, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar, Newly Diagnosed with Atopic Dermatitis, What You Need to Know. I'm Carrie Gautier, Associate Director of Marketing and Communications. We see that people are still logging on and want to give them a few minutes to join us. While we're waiting, I want to make sure you all know about the upcoming activities here at NIA. 2018, we'll see a new series of webinars throughout the year. If there's a topic that you would like to see covered, please let us know. We have a contact form on our website and we'd love to hear from you. We will be hosting our three-day conference again in June, the 21st through the 24th in 2018, and that will be in Chicago, Illinois. So save the date. Registration should be open early in January, and it should be great fun, so come and join us. Would you like to share your story with us? Because we would love to hear it. We share personal stories of people's lives with eczema throughout the year in a segment called My Journey, and that appears online and in our print magazine, Eczema Matters. Contact us online to get the process started. And finally, would you like to participate in eczema research from the comfort of your very own home? Our research app, My Eczema, does just that. You can download it on any Apple device and get started today. The app will help you track your eczema flares while contributing to active eczema research. Looks like we're about ready to start. So for those of you who have just joined us, I'm Carrie Gautier, Associate Director of Marketing Communications at the National Eczema Association. I'd like to welcome you to the National Eczema Association's webinar, Newly Diagnosed with Atopic Dermatitis, What You Need to Know. This webinar is being recorded and will be shared with all attendees within a week. The National Eczema Association is a national patient-oriented organization which is governed by a board of directors and guided by a scientific advisory committee comprised of physicians, nurses, and scientists who volunteer their time and expertise. We work to improve the health and quality of life for individuals with eczema through research, support, and education. Tonight's presenter is Dr. Teller. He is a great champion of NIA and has presented at our Leaders in Eczema One Day Forum in Houston last year. He is a founding physician with Bel Air Dermatology Associates of Houston and a clinical instructor of dermatology at Baylor College of Medicine and UT Houston Medical School. Dr. Teller will present for approximately 30 to 50 minutes. Please use the questions section to the right of your screen in the control panel to send us questions throughout the presentation. Following his presentation, we will have a short two minutes for additional questions to be submitted. Dr. Teller will answer as many questions as possible after his presentation. And additional questions that we are unable to answer due to time will be answered in a follow-up Q&A write-up and will be shared with all registrants. And with that, I am pleased to introduce our presenter, Dr. Craig Teller. Thank you very much. Um, you guys, I am happy to have you on there, and I think uh, you found a wonderful organization with the NEA. And um, without further ado, we'll move in because if you're newly diagnosed and you just want to know more about atopic dermatitis, um, let's get to the information because as you know, this is not a fun condition to have. Um, I think she's already talked about the upcoming events here. Um, did you want to mention any of these? I think you already talked about these just a moment ago. Um, so moving straight in, um, and she's already talked about the National Eczema Association. would urge every one of you guys online to join. And, first, and if you haven't been to the website, I will tell you, uh, as a dermatologist, it's one of the best supportive websites I've seen. Um, it gives you more information. It could literally do this presentation for me. So please utilize that website. We send our patients to that website regularly. Dr. So, Teller, jump in really quickly. I'm not seeing your slides. 
can you just double check that you're sharing your screen with us? I can. Um, you want to give me controls again? I think I did. Let's try that again. There we go. How about now? Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so here's uh, just a quick slide on how to submit questions. Um, so you'll see your go to webinar control panel, and you can look at this. Um, and, and do try to keep your audio muted. Um, and otherwise, happy to entertain and go through as many questions as we can. So, um, newly diagnosed with atopic dermatitis, what you need to know. First of all, obviously, um, just my disclosures. Um, I am a, a big advocate for atopic dermatitis, eczema, and clinical research. So as you can see, I do a lot of clinical studies for the companies listed there, and then also work as far as a speaker and as a consultant to try to help education amongst patients and physicians. So what is eczema? I mean, half the time it's a word that's hard to spell, um, let, alone, let alone pronounce. Um, it's actually derived from the Greek word meaning to boil over, and if you have eczema, I think you can understand. Literally, your skin feels like it's boiling over, and literally, uh, you are maxed out with trying to deal with it and the itch, and you're boiling over mentally with handling it. You'll hear the doctors, and in the literature, you'll hear people say atopic dermatitis or dermatitis, and then they'll say eczema. Understand that those terms are used interchangeably. They mean the same thing. They're synonyms. And then when someone says atopic dermatitis, it means a specific type of eczema. So I could simply say atopic eczema and be saying the same thing. So in a nutshell, if you had to explain what it meant to somebody in an elevator, it's a skin problem that causes dry, extremely itchy, scaly, flaky, red skin, and it can happen to anyone, infants, children, and adults. It has a very strong genetic component, and if you try to explain it to somebody, it is, as I explained to my patient, the itch that rashes. So if you think about it, most of the time people get a rash, the rash comes, and it itches, and you scratch it. Atopic dermatitis is the exact opposite. It, your skin is inherently itchy beyond your control. And because it itches, you can't help but scratch. When you scratch, you create the rash. Therefore, we like to refer to it as the itch that rashes. So what is atopic dermatitis? It's really hard to have a chronic condition and not have anyone tell you this is the exact cause. And we all like to be able to say, well, if I gave it to my kids, what, did, what can I do to change it? If I have it as an adult, what am I not doing right? You need to understand that you are not alone. Probably estimated that probably up to over 30 million Americans now with recent estimates epidemiologically have eczema. And in fact, um, it is one of the more common diseases. It is a number that I think as we get more awareness and we get more treatments coming out um, and more research going into it, which we have now, I think we're going to find that there are more and more people affected. Um, the cause, like I mentioned, everyone wants a reason why. And it's really hard because we say we can't tell you exactly because we don't know. The cause is complex. It's due to numerous factors and they're making a lot of advances um, to help us help you and for you to help yourself in managing and possibly something that we didn't consider before, but putting your eczema into remission, which means put it into a quiet phase for a period of time, which everyone would love. Um, I would love that for all of my patients. More treatment options, guys. Help is on the way. That's why on my disclosure slide, we're doing clinical research on a whole host of medications that look to be very effective and that's very exciting. 
So getting into a little bit more specifically about the specifics of atopic dermatitis. Uh, one thing to remember is this is a condition that, again, we'll repeat over and over, intense, intense pruritus. Pruritus is the medical word for itch. Xerosis, the medical word for dry skin. These are two things that if you have eczema, you inherently have more itch in your skin and more dry skin. It then leads to those red bumps or papules, and then those red, big, raised areas are what we call plaques than anyone else. And this is also called the atopic diathesis, or perhaps the atopic triad. You don't have to have all three, but we find people have a high propensity to have seasonal allergies if you have this, and that means hay fever. A high propensity or tendency to have asthma, and then the skin component, the eczema. Typically, the onset is in childhood, but as we're finding, more and more adults are accounting for cases. And we're seeing now that the estimates are, I would tell you the number is probably closer to 20% um, of cases now are adult onset. Never had it as a kid and then pops up again in adulthood. And that, I mean, not pops up anew in adulthood, which really stinks because you'd like to just know that this is something that you can eventually get rid of and not have to deal with as an adult. Uh, this is a condition that waxes and wanes. So I think, and I coach my patients, that take a deep breath, understand that this is going to be something that you're going to get fatigued with. You're going to get tired of treatment and dealing with this. So we're going to arm you with as many pearls and tips as we can so that you can manage yourself at home. But when you have a severe flare, that's when you call on your dermatologist and then want to put you into remission and get into those quiet periods. And you see, obviously, the clinical pictures, which you guys don't need to see. You're living with it. This, to me, this slide really is, I think if you live with it, you can understand. This is a chronic, which means it, it doesn't go away. Relapsing comes and goes. Highly inflammatory skin condition. And... The symptoms that predominate are a little bit different. Unlike anything else, the first two questions I ask a patient in my office, if you have eczema, I want to know your itch score. This is a condition that itches like nothing else. And to help you feel a little bit better, oftentimes people in other medical fields say, well, it's just a skin condition. You want to put them in your shoes because guess what? If you've got pain, you have analgesics. We have pain medicines that can effectively treat pain. We do not have any medical treatment, therapy, pharmacology that can effectively reduce and take away itch. So the itch, I ask for an itch score. We base it on zero to ten. Zero is no itching. Ten is the worst itching of your life. So we follow your itch score to understand how well are we controlling you and are we putting you into remission? The second thing that hopefully this will be an eye opener for a lot of you, particularly if you've got moderate or greater eczema, is their sleep disturbance. We now know that eczema or atopic dermatitis is also a condition of sleep disruption. And I ask the second question to all of my patients, how is your sleep? Give me your sleep score. I need a zero to ten. 10 means you've been up all night scratching and rubbing and tossing and turning and feel like you've never slept. It's literally a sleep deprivation condition. A zero would be a perfect night of sleep. I'm finding that with most of my moderate to severe eczema patients, they generally start off with an itch score about a 7, 8, 9, or 10. Believe it or not, their sleep score is often an 8, 9, or 10. It's horrible. I often, if they're an adult and they're significant others in the room, ask for their sleep score because they'll often tell you it's a 7, 8, or 9 because they know you can't help it, but you're tossing and turning and very disrupted with that itch, and therefore you're not sleeping well. If it's a kid and you're a parent out there, I ask the parents for their sleep score because if your kid's having, suffering from eczema, your sleep is going to be disturbed as well. And then the other characteristic signs 
we're just getting the repetition so you understand the hallmarks to make this up, dry skin, inflammation, redness, red bumps, flaking skin, and then once that skin is open, secondary infection, meaning like staph infections or strep infections of the skin. The other cardinal features that go along with having a topic eczema or atopic dermatitis, your skin does not hold lipid like it should. And therefore, you can put moisturizer on, and a few minutes later, it feels dry as fish skin. It looks as dry as fish skin. So chronic, severely dry, and then, of course, very itchy skin. We talked about that family history of atopy. So it's that triad that we talked about, the skin, the eczema, the hay fever, or the allergic rhinitis, and then asthma. Here's the other thing. If you have eczema, have you noticed that it seems like your skin overreacts to everything? That is part and parcel of having eczema, unfortunately. We call it skin hyperreactivity, and you respond to incredible amounts of various stimuli, food, things that you may inhale like mold or pollen or pine, um, and then any irritants, whether it be soaps or detergents or anything else. Your skin is exquisitely overly sensitive. Here's the issue. Everyone wants to point back and say, well, if I can eliminate that food, I can eliminate that allergen, that irritant, what's the holy grail? Give it to me. I'll eliminate it. The eczema will go away. Unfortunately, that's rarely the case. We know these are aggravating factors, exacerbating factors, but they are not the cause. And then what happens? That skin is hyperreactive, it's overly dry, it doesn't hold moisture. Guess what ends up happening? Your barrier is disrupted. And now you end up with skin infections. Literally, if you have atopic eczema, the skin, 100% of your skin is generally, 100% of atopics, your skin is colonized with fast bacteria. So what happens is then when you create even more scratches and there it allows that staph bacteria that's already colonized there to go down and cause secondary infection. If you've ever wondered about some of the other factors that go along with eczema, take a look. Particularly in kids, there's what we call central facial pallor, which means more of a white look, particularly around the mouth and the central face area. Keratosis pilaris. Those are those rough, like goosebumps, like areas on the back of the arm, often on the top of the thighs, or on the back of the thighs. That goes along perfectly with eczema and hay fever. Periorbital darkening. Wonder why you have those dark circles under your eyes? It's part of, unfortunately, part of eczema. You scratch and rub enough. Unfortunately, you end up with an extra fold underneath the eye, an extra crinkle or wrinkle. It's not uncommon to get nipple eczema, hand eczema, the hands are involved, lip irritation. And then look at your palm. It's interesting. We call it hyperlinearity, but there's actually extra lines within your palm. And then if it's not enough that you're dealing with all this, it's on your hands, nipples, guess what? Then it, it, it attacks your face. Another very, very common area of the eyelid. So everyone wants to know what causes it. Please, just give me the reason. I'll do whatever it needs to to fix it. We still don't understand. The rest assured that the NEA and the scientific researchers and physicians are working to come up with the cause. We know a whole lot more than we did even three years ago. There are very strong genetic or hereditary factors, and that explains why if you have it or your kid has it, there's generally someone first degree, second degree relative that has it. And what happens is because of that genetic um, issue, there is a dysfunction in your outer layer of skin called the epidermis. That skin outer layer is meant to protect you from the rest of the environment, the rest of the world. Your barrier is impaired and the function is not protecting you from all those irritants that we already talked about and bacteria, and that explains why everything bothers you. And then guess what ends up happening if that's not enough? You're cursed with having what we call transepidermal water loss and loss of skin lipids or fat, and that explains why you have dry skin, extremely dry skin. 
And this is so important because the epidermis or the outer layer is that line of defense, like I talked about, between your body and the outside environment. And when it's intact, it can keep all the things that are listed below out. So getting a little bit more scientific for just a moment, we know that skin inflammation, um, the skin barrier dysfunction, allows stimuli, something that we don't understand, to set off an overreaction in your immune response. So now your immune system, which is healthy, you don't have a deficient immune system, is overreacting to something from the outside that then causes your body to overreact in the inside and create this whole cascade. And these are fancy things that talked about increased pH 2, pH 22. Here's the good news. We now know things we didn't know before. For instance, we know IL-31 and TSLP are two of the biggest factors that actually are causing itch. And now we can start to create medications to target exactly that. In fact, one of the studies we're doing in our office is looking at blocking IL-31 and if that will actually help to block or stop the itch, which is huge. So the other thing with the therapeutics, if we target this abnormal over-immune response to whatever the stimuli that gets it started, we can do we can put you into a comfortable spot, put your eczema into remission without causing serious side effects. The medicines have, the advances have been terrific. And it's always, to me, I look for what I call a terrific trio with medication. So the doctor, your dermatologist, your allergist wants to prescribe a medicine. I want to see three things. One, it needs to work. Two, it needs to be safe. And three, you need to be able to get access to it. It needs to be available. The insurance company, the pharmaceutical company, please just let me get access to the medication. And we're seeing greater work with that. And obviously, just another plug to the NEA, if you work with the NEA, they can certainly help advocate to make sure that eczema patients have access to the latest, greatest medications that are available. So skin barriers. That outside layer is called the stratum corneum. This is just a repeat of what we've already talked about. So if you look at the schematics here, you see the normal skin, a tight seal. You see the slide on the, the picture on the right, dermatitis. There's cracks, you see the black arrow going through. Now the irritants and the allergens can get through and set off that immune hyper response. Guess what ends up happening? When that's broken, these fancy words, antimicrobial peptide, all that means is your skin has a natural antibiotic effect. When you're br broken, the antibiotic effect is not there. The ability to retain moisture in your skin is not there, and the ability to protect you from the outside world is not there. The result is the atopic dermatitis and the severe itch that you're dealing with. So this is a slide that we'll skip through because it goes through a little bit more detail into some of the technicalities. There is one thing to be aware of, it's called filagrin, and filagrin is, stands for filament aggregating protein, and basically it's what aggregates and holds the tight seal for that upper layer, and when you have a tight seal upper layer, guess what, things don't get through, you're protected, and we understand there's a defect in this filagrin as well. So you understand we have a lot of targets that we're going after to help you feel better and to help to get you in a better spot. And that's what this slide here talks about is in 2009 they figured out that filagrin, fancy word, just simply means it's, your skin's not holding tight and not protecting like we'd like to, which leads to the dryness, the itching, and your skin overreacting. The other thing that we talk about is this itch, scratch, itch cycle. And the itch, scratch, itch cycle, if you think about it, is your skin itches. So you do everything you can to keep from scratching. Finally, you can't take it anymore and you scratch. Guess what? When you start scratching, your skin, your body plays an evil trick on you. It creates more chemicals, what we call cytokines, to make more itching. Guess what ends up happening? It itches more, therefore you scratch more, and you are in a vicious circle or cycle. And it's something sometimes that we call the atopic march. So, what everyone needs to know, you're hopefully getting a little bit better understanding of something that I've got to tell you, it's a little bit hard to understand 
what does that mean, eczema? What is it? Um, but bottom line, if we can figure out a way to improve the dry skin, if we can find a way to help you control scratching, which, uh, which means blocking the itching or reducing itching, and this is all caused by immune overreactivity, guess what ends up happening? We can end up helping to make you feel better. So basic skin care right from the very start, whether you have mild eczema or more severe, is going to help prevent that cascade from getting worse. So here is the basics of how to repair that skin barrier. Number one, always think about putting water back in the skin. Your body, your skin genetically will not hold water well. And then once that water is in the skin, number two, we want to seal that water in. And then number three, what can we reduce within our control as far as aggravating factors? Lastly, we want to heal or target the high inflammation which creates the redness. And that's the big factor that we're now realizing with a lot of the medications. We can stop, stop that immune system from overreacting and creating hot inflammation in your skin and throughout your body. And then lastly, obviously, reduce the bacterial load because once the bacteria is there, this is an evil trick that is happening to you and your body is overreacting to everything, including that bacteria. How do we put the water back in the skin? It's really pretty simple. It's the thing that a lot of dermatologists years ago told you not to do, and that was to soak in a bathtub. That's the way to get some moisture back into your skin. Um, in fact, if you talk to most pediatric dermatologists who have done an extra year of specialization in only working with kiddos, um, they'll tell you baths are much preferable to showering. So what happens? You put the water back in the skin by getting in the bathtub. Get into a ritual, a daily or nightly tub soak. Great way to relax because guess what? Stress exacerbates everything. And if you have atopic dermatitis, there is more of a personality trait to have higher amounts of anxiety as well as obsessive compulsive features. So when you get into that bath, avoid harsh soaks. Unfortunately for the kiddos, no bubble bath. It tends to be more irritating. Use your not gentle non-soap cleansers whenever possible, as well as mild shampoos, and reserve them for the very end of the bath. And then here's the most important thing. When you get out of the bathtub, pat dry. Do not rub dry. If you rub dry, you're going to stimulate more itching. Remember I said when you rub the skin, skin plays a dirty trick on you. It releases more chemicals to create more itching, and therefore you're going to get into a, an itching frenzy. Other thing, keep it, unfortunately, a little bit cooler. The warmer it is, if you've ever noticed, if you have eczema, heat, perspiration tend to set off more itching. So I know you want to be in a warm bathtub and get out into a warm bathroom, but keep the temperature a little bit cooler. And then, while the skin is still damp, apply your moisturizer you'll get literally tenfold greater absorption of the moisturizer into the skin. And then once it's into the skin, you want to keep it there. You want to seal it in. And that's where you want to go with things like Aquaphor or Vaseline, very thick, greasy-like ointment. It's not fun, but it's extraordinarily important. You soak the skin in water. You now need that very, very greasy, rich emollient to keep the water in. And these greasy ones are the best, are the most economical, and they're the best at helping skin retain the water and avoiding lotion. Another thing, watch out for marketing. Nothing against this particular brand, but anything that simply says it's for babies doesn't mean it's more gentle. And in fact, more things like that have that fragrance, that baby smell. Guess what? That will be one more thing that can set you off or create aggravation. What are our go-to emollients? So emollients are basically a fancy word for moisturizers. We prefer ointment, the greasy one, petrolatum, plain petrolatum. I've had patients who've been in a horrible situation, couldn't afford anything, actually having to get Crisco 
from the grocery store. That actually works. Aquaphor, it's a little bit fancier, but it really works. If you can't tolerate those thicker ointments, go with creams. Some of the brands that you know that work, Cetaphil, Eucerin, CeraVe. Here's another tip. Look for the National Eczema Association NEA seal of acceptance. It means a lot. In fact, if you go to the NEA website, it'll help give you a list of different moisturizers and over-the-counter products that are go-to and have gotten that seal that are approved by the dermatologist to make sure these are medicines that really do make a difference and are the preferred for treating eczema. I know you hate doing this, but if you can grease that more than once a day, it's going to help improve that skin barrier function and you're going to be a whole lot better. So, in the perfect world, it sure would be nice if we could eliminate all the things that, that aggravate us. Emotional stress and anxiety will really set this off. You're going to see your skin overreact anytime you get stressed out. I love exercise. It's one of the ways I release steam and, and, and stress. Unfortunately, you're going to have to work with heat and perspiration, particularly when you're working out. It tends to aggravate eczema and make your skin feel worse. What do I tell a lot of my patients to do? I tell them to keep a cool bag of frozen washcloths with them and then put those onto the areas once they start feeling itchy or overheating. Rapid temperature changes can also be a trigger to set off eczema. Anything irritating, keep everything as fragrance-free, as chemical-free as possible. It's a whole lot easier. The wintertime right now starts to get cooler. People want to put on wool or polyester. Guess what? Quick trigger to start itching, putting on that wool sweater. Allergens. Pollen, pet dander, doesn't mean you don't have them. It's always going to be around. You just try to reduce them. Dust mites do aggravate things. I'll pay a big one. Cigarette smoke. So if you're a smoker and you have eczema, it's one of the quick ways to reduce your eczema and almost make it completely better smoking cessation. Or if there's someone in your environment that smokes, I promise you it's going to set off or aggravate your eczema. Along those lines of, God, there's, got to, there's bound to be a reason why I have this. You can ask your dermatologist or your allergist to do patch testing. In our office, we do advanced patch testing. The dermatologist puts on selected chemicals that are on adhesive strips and these patches and they apply them to your back after listening to the things that you're most likely reacting to. In our office, we usually put on adhesive strips of about 80 to 100 different um, possibilities, and then they're left on for 48 hours and removed. And then we check and find out which of these, when they touch your skin, are actually setting off a reaction. At that point, we can tell you nickel, um, preservatives, fragrance, whatever it might be, this is something you want to reduce and try to eliminate because it is aggravating your eczema. So if you haven't had patch testing, it's a good way to help figure out what are the things that might be aggravating it. But just a caveat, don't look for the cure. Understand this is just going to ratchet it down a bunch of notches and make it more comfortable for you. A patch test is often not the same as what the allergist does with prick testing, where they make the little needle pricks onto the skin. That's to usually identify food and environmental allergies. Quick word on food allergies just for a second. We all want to find a cause. We want to find a reason. Why? What am I doing wrong? And unfortunately, food comes up very, very readily. Food is rarely the cause that will, if you stop a certain food, gluten, stop a certain egg, citrus, dairy, whatever it might be, that will eliminate your eczema. It may make it worse, and you can do cause and effect, but I can tell you that rarely is a food allergy the exact reason why you have eczema or atopic eczema. And in fact, the easy way to figure out food allergies 
is once you've taken the food in, temporal or time relationship is almost always within 30 minutes. 30 minutes, and then you then after you've ingested that food within 30 minutes, you're going to note a problem. So we've lost the moisture. We want to seal it back in. Now we've got redness and we've got inflammation. We need to heal that inflammation. The go-to for most people who have mild eczema, if you're new to this, are what we call topical steroids. They're our first line. They work really well. What do they do? Your blood vessels and capillaries at the top of your skin get overflowing with all those extra chemicals that make you itch. The topical steroids work in a really nice way. They just constrict down the blood vessels so you can't release as many chemicals that set off the itching reaction within your body. Thus, you're helping to heal the inflammation or the redness in the subsequent response. When you use the topical steroids appropriately and following your dermatologist's instructions, you're rarely going to have side effects. Unfortunately, the topical steroids do not work to the point of lasting all day, every day. They tend to wear off after a period of time, and so you need to notice that you're going to probably be using it for long periods of time. But when you finally get that inflammation down enough, you can start to taper and then hopefully discontinue the topical steroids. Lastly, try, if you can, to encourage your doctor, your dermatologist, to use the ointment, the greasier ones. They actually are doing healing the inflammation and sealing in the moisture at the same time. And then this is, again, this is from our National Dermatology Society of the American Academy of Dermatology, and it just talks about some general guidelines for using topical steroids. Again, don't let the word steroid scare you. These are very safe medications when you use under appropriate instruction and following what you need to do, and this will be here later for reference. And again, how do we classify those topical steroids? A million different names. Here's the key. If you look on the far right side of the screen, it talks about strength. Everyone likes to think that a bigger number means that the stronger the medicine. That's not what's going on. It has to do with the molecule. So if you look under the drug name, that's what you want to know. So you know the ones that say glucobetasol propionate. That's a very high potency. If you go all the way down to the bottom, class 7 would be 1% hydrocortisone over the counter. That's the weakest. So we rank them based on 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. You certainly can ask your doc, hey, what is the potency of this? You'll notice so often how to use high potency to get the flare under control and then take you down to usually a class 3 or 4 so that you're using the lowest potency possible to keep yourself under control. What else is available for reducing the inflammation and that irritation? Here's the good news. We have some new medications, and they are not steroids. So they don't use that same pathway to reduce inflammation. Here's the problem. So if you use your topical steroids day in and day out and use them at too high of a strength for too long or use them in creases like the underarms or the face or the groin, Topical steroids can lead to broken spider veins. They can lead to even stretch marks um, and thin the skin significantly. So it's one of the reasons that you need to talk with your doctor and ask, hey, are there other medicines or non-steroid medicine approaches? That would be things we call the topical immune modulators, the calcineurin inhibitors. The brand names would be Protopic or Eladil. They're very safe, and they can be used in combination with topical steroids. Here's one of my pearls. I ask people to use it as off-label. It's not going to be on the, on the package. Put your medicines in the refrigerator. Refrigerate them before use. That cool going on, again, cool versus heat seems to reduce itching and helps to make you feel better. There is a brand new medication one of the newest on the market available that's the newest non-steroidal approach, and its generic name is Crisoberol. Its brand name is called Eucrisa. So now we've got another non-steroid approach, 
And again, these can be used with or without topical steroids. Again, this is again later on for reference. Um, when you go onto the internet, I'll just simply say, understand that these medicines are extremely safe and talk to your doctor because there are warnings that are based on old information and you need to be up to date and understand that they are very safe with time. What else reduces the inflammation and the irritation? Wet dressings or wet wraps. One of my favorites. It's inexpensive and there's a bunch of ways to do it. Do it. One, <clears throat> take a bath, pat dry, and then immediately put on some of your topical steroids or whichever medication you're using. I love then to use things like Vaseline and then wrap the skin. You can wrap them in cool towels. You can take this and wrap it, believe it or not, within saran wrap. I like to have people take terry cloth cotton clothes or warm up and put those on. A whole bunch of ways that then you can create those wet dressing or occlusions. And then it helps soothe and hydrate the skin. It reduces that itching and redness. And it also is that occlusion is there, particularly with the wet towels, it loosens the crusted or scabbed areas without picking at them because that'll make it worse and prevents the skin injury from scratching. How do you stop the itch? Again, if you have mild eczema, moderate eczema, you're going to find we don't have great pills or medications to help. We use oral antihistamine. So you might be familiar with some of the over-the-counter brands, things like Claritin, Allegra, Zyrtec. Those can help but they are not going to be particularly effective in helping stop the itch. Benadryl, one of the more common ones. Benadryl does better at making you sleepy so you don't feel the itch and you fall asleep more than it helps to block the itch. And I've got to tell you that's the truth with most of these antihistamines. If you've seen your doctor and they prescribe things like Adirax or generic name hydroxyzine, or medicine even that's an antidepressant, but terrific at helping to reduce itch, is doxepin or Senequan. The main effect of these medicines, they are so terrific, are they're sedating. Therefore, I like to use them as nighttime doses. Why? Most people who have atopic dermatitis find that their itching escalates or worsens at bedtime. So another pearl. I like to tell my patients, take these sedating antihistamines, whether it's Benadryl or whatever you are, I like to have them take it at least an hour before bedtime. There, by the time you get into bed, and by the way, create a cool bedroom environment, cotton sheets, so that it's been as more relaxing, less itching threshold, and you're already sleepy by the time you get into bed and you fall asleep. Remember, we talked about this being a sleep disturbance as well. So we've now helped to help block that itching. We also want to reduce the bacteria on the skin. How do you know when it's infected? Usually what people call scabs. We call it crusting. It's oozing. It may even have a kind of a golden honey-colored look to it. It's red, and it's typically tender or uncomfortable. At that point, Topical or oral antibiotics are often necessary, at least on a short-term basis. The topical or oral antibiotics, things like polysporin, neosporin, there's a prescription one called mupiracin or bactroban. They really can help, and they reduce the bacteria, which helps the skin barrier heal. It's very interesting. People are scared of the systemic or biologic medicines. Our newest biologic advance, which is a brand named Dupixin or Dupilumab, actually increases the AMP or the antimicrobial peptide in the skin. What does that mean? Remember I told you you have a natural antibiotic in your skin? That natural antibiotic, the levels go down when your eczema is flaring. Dupixin actually helps put the lipids back into your skin, and Dupixin actually increases the levels of the natural antibiotic in your skin, 
So that you notice there's less infections, skin infections, and less bacteria. The biggest thing you can do, bleach bath. Bleach bath, whether you have mild eczema or severe eczema. This sounds so counterintuitive. You're asking me to get into irritating bleach and water and get and make my eczema better? You need to give it a try. You'll be blown away with how effective it is. This is something that what you'll do if it's a full bathtub, a half a cup of bleach into a full bathtub. Yes, regular Clorox bleach. If it's a half a tub, a fourth a cup of bleach. It's just like pool water. It's not going to affect your hair. You can even put your head under water. You want to soak for about 10 minutes. And then get out and pat dry gently and then apply your topical medicines and then cover that. Seal the moisture in with the emollients or Vaseline. Do these bleach baths if you're really flaring on a daily basis or as little as twice weekly if you're in a more of a maintenance mode. It's amazing. This is something once you do it, you're going to become addicted to doing it. In fact, the newest evidence shows us that using bleach baths actually reduces that inflammation and redness in your skin. So again, completely counterintuitive to what you might think. Again, this will be a huge pearl no matter what type of eczema, mild to moderate to severe. If your doctor wants to recommend something and you are really tired of using topical therapy, and it's across a lot of your body, Phototherapy is really effective. Phototherapy is different than going to a tanning salon. Tanning salon uses UVA light. That actually damages the skin over time, ages the skin, and can cause skin cancer. With phototherapy that we use, in our office we have what's called narrowband UVB. It is a very specific 311 nanometer wavelength. What's the gist? Doesn't cause skin cancer but it causes the skin to calm down. What's the downside? You're going to need to go into that treatment probably three times a week for the first month and then go into a maintenance phase where you might be in there once or twice a week for another month or two. Guess what? It can put you into remission and quiet it down quite significantly. So certainly look for that as another option when you're certainly tired of topical therapy or there's too much to use for topical. Here's the other pearl I would tell you. A lot of the doctors and dermatologists don't recognize how long it's taking you if you have to put on your medicine. And I ask my patients, in the morning, how long does it take you to get your topical medicine on? How long does it take you at night? I ask them, if it takes more than 10, 15 minutes, I tell them that's too much. We need to be moving to a different therapy because most people who has the time in their day to use 15, 20 minutes in the morning, 15, 20 minutes at night, it's too much. That's a sign to me that your eczema is too widespread, too severe. Let your doctor know how long it takes. I need to find another therapy like phototherapy. And then you see something that looks really scary called the immunosuppressant medication. This means your eczema is really significant, moderate to severe. If you want to be able to communicate with your doctor how severe it is, look at your palm. Your palm is 1% of your body. Let your doctor know how many palms of psoriasis are on your body. The general rule are that if there's 10 palms or 10% of your body surface area, by almost all standards, that's pretty severe eczema. When it's that severe, we need to calm down the overactive immune system. That overactive immune system is not suppressing your immune system to the point of causing you to have problems of infection or cancer, but these are more potent medications, and they are effective, and we encourage you that they can be used safely. They're typically in pill form, and the examples of medicines you might have heard of are methotrexate, Cyclosporin, it's also used called Gengraf or Neoral, and then Mycophenolate Mopatil, which is called Celsem. These are often used, and there's another one that's called, as well called Azathioprine or Imuran. These are off label, but I promise you, you need to find a doctor if you've got moderate to severe eczema, 
to make sure that they know how to use these medicines and they can use them safely for you to get it under control. What are we excited about? If I, a dermatologist treating eczema, we're excited about the biologics. Biologics are medicines that are engineered from proteins that are targeted for a specific overactive part of the immune system. They have to be given by injection because they're what we call large molecules. If you try to swallow them, it would be a very expensive meal. So they have to be given by shock. The biologic Dupilumab, brand name Dupixin, is the newest advent on the market. This is a medication that works by targeting, remember we talked about, that overactive immune system. It slows down that overreactivity and reduces the inflammation very rapidly, which in turn takes away the itching. I've been very fortunate to have done the clinical trials for Dupixin for adults, as well as their device study, and we're now working on their adolescent study, uh, and then getting ready to start the pediatric study. What have I noticed? I've noticed with this medication, typically the itch score, the sleep score, may start off at a seven, eight, or nine, very rapidly go down to a two or three. The common phrase I get from my patients is, I feel like I have my life back. So depending on where you live, take a look. Find out what new biologics are out there. They are under intense scrutiny, and we're going to make sure they're safe. Um, most of the studies are available for, uh, the depictions available for anyone over the age of 18, but certainly studies are underway now for pediatrics as well. Lastly, a topic dermatitis and your mental health. Mental health is huge here. Most people who get atopic dermatitis are concomitantly diagnosed with depression and anxiety. It feels like the skin has betrayed them. And therefore, they are literally going nuts with the itch, the frustration. So it's not uncommon. So when this happens, Make sure that you're keeping mental health in mind. Talk to your doctor. Do all the right things that help you to reduce stress or feel better. If you have to get assistance, get therapy, do what you need to do because there's a huge relationship between the mind and the skin. And when the mind is calm, the skin will often calm down as well. And then again, another reminder, with mental health, guess what? When you're not getting sleep, you feel miserable. Mentally, you feel miserable as well. So one more connection between atopic dermatitis and mental health. Again, here are some of those symptoms. This will be on the website or on the webinar uh, review to look at. So again, I will tell you, you need to express this to your doctor if you're feeling this way. It's important. You need to treat all of you, not just your skin, and understand this is really important. So in summary, um, eczema, which is interchangeable with dermatitis, and we talked about the specific top of type, which is called atopic dermatitis, which can be associated with asthma and hay fever and allergies, can be mild to severe. Hallmark features, severe itch, sleep disturbance, dry skin. Don't be frustrated. There's not a cure, but we're getting closer, and guess what? It can be controlled. Don't get into a blame game. You didn't cause it. You didn't do anything wrong. This is something that you're going to learn how to handle. I've seen patients, I've seen parents go on all kinds of food elimination diets, go through all kinds of food allergies, spend hundreds of dollars on supplements. I promise you, if that were the cure, we'd all be doing it. Cause and effect. If it works for you, great. But that's not going to be the panacea for the Holy Grail for most of us. And when it's severe, it does feel like your body hates you. It's betraying you. So the treatments are getting better and better. So hopefully the presentation gave you an idea of the therapies that are out there. And more help is on the way. Don't give up. And certainly utilize your resources, especially the National Eczema Association. Thank you so much, Dr. Teller. What a phenomenal presentation. I'm sure we all learned a great deal. I'm going to jump back on here. Hi, everyone. 
Um, we are going to run over just a few short minutes um, so that we can get some questions going. Um, so we'll move on to the question and answer portion right now. Uh, we will take the next couple of minutes to receive additional questions. So if you have questions that haven't been answered by Dr. Teller's phenomenal presentation, um, now is the time to submit them. And I will go ahead and um, ask those questions for on your behalf. Um, so while we wait for those questions to come in, just a quick reminder that we want to encourage you to get involved with National Eczema Association and help raise awareness about this disease. There are a ton of ways to get involved. You can become an ambassador, sharing your eczema journey in writing or in person, working in grassroots adv advocacy, joining our online support community eczema-wise, and more. You can attend events, as I mentioned before, save the date, our three-day conference is coming in June of next year, the 21st through the 24th in Chicago. And of course, you can always donate as a 501c3 nonprofit. Our work relies on the support of our community. Let's go ahead and get started with our questions. Some really great ones came in. So um, let's start with, um, how do you know when to treat for a staph infection? Because that is a known common co uh, comorbidity of eczema. Sure. Again, remember that literally your skin is colonized. So it means that if you have eczema, literally 100% of the patients with eczema have staph already on the skin. Now, when it becomes infected, the difference is it becomes red. You start to see the scabs form. And then one of the hallmark features is hurt, pain. So when you start to have areas that feel more tender, they're more uncomfortable, they're not itching as much, but the more red, tender, sensitive, that's a hallmark feature of infection, particularly a staph infection. And not generally going to run a fever unless it becomes a whole severe area. So that's the time to start your topical antibiotics. If you can start with over-the-counter, the brand names, obviously everyone knows polyspore and neosporin. The mupirocin or Bactroban prescription is one of the most effective targeting just staph aureus. Great. Are there any uh, beneficial numbing sprays for itchiness? There are. Um, anytime you can get a counter sensation to what your skin is feeling, so some of those numbing medications, they're not all numbing, um, but some of them look for an ingredient called Promoxine, P-R-A-M-O-X-I-N-E, Promoxine 1%. So over the counter, it creates a change in sensation in the skin, and for most patients with eczema, it doesn't irritate. So that's a great one to look for. Another one that's readily available over the counter is called Sarna Lotion. Sarna, again, anything that starts to have menthol, even things like camphor, which can burn, but anything particularly menthol, which changes that sensation, has more of a numbing effect on the skin. Lidocaine. Lidocaine, when you talk about actually numbing the skin, there are things that have very small amounts of topical numbing over the counter. There are prescription topical numbing creams. They can be used as well. Here's the, here's the caveat. Remember, we talked about the hyperactivity. So it's going to be playing around and find what works for you. Anything you can do to get counter sensation, and I think that's what you're getting at is, I can't take the itch anymore, you got to just numb it. That's another thing. By the way, you want to get the cheapest numbing agent, ice. Take ice. I like to tell patients, take a plastic baggie, put your washcloth in it, water, put it in the freezer, pull it out, put it onto the area it actually helps to numb up the area and it actually acts as an anesthetic. Oh, great. An interesting question came in. Uh, one of the, ski, the key skin lipids that is shown is cholesterol. And so for somebody who's taking a cholesterol lowering medication, is that potentially a contributing factor to dry skin? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you would inherently, you think, um, I, you would be reducing lipid levels 
the cholesterol specific is you have a good eye in noticing that on the screen. Um, but this is different. So the Lipitor, the statins that we call them, they stop the manufacturing of excess cholesterol that the liver is making. And therefore, which goes into the intestines and gets into the bloodstream to cause heart disease. So it's a different one, to, a different mechanism of cholesterol that it's targeting. You need that cho the cholesterol that's in the skin, which isn't going, which is not being depleted. Simple answer, it's not being depleted by your Lipitor, Atorvastatin, Crestor, or your lipid or cholesterol-lowering medication. So do that for your general heart health. Don't worry that it's going to aggravate or exacerbate your eczema. Great. Um, for people who are on weekly or m multi times a week allergy uh, injections, how how do that how does that help with eczema? So, when you are noted by patch testing or particularly prick testing to have an environmental allergy. Uh, what happens, let's take in, let's, let's use ragweed or, or mold. What they do with the, with the weekly skin uh, uh, allergy shots, it's called immunotherapy, they start giving you small amounts of it over time. And gradually with those shots, the dose of, they're actually giving you doses of what you're allergic to. To gradually try to get your body to build up, if you will, the ability to become resistant to antibodies so that you stop reacting to that. How does that help? If you can stop overreacting to the things that irritate you and set you off, your eczema is going to stay a whole lot calmer. Great. It won't cure it. Wish it would cure it, but it won't cure it. Right. Still waiting for that cure. Um, can you speak a little bit to hand eczema? We have several people who have identified that they have specifically hand eczema and how that may or may not be a topic versus contact and how would they know and um, is there anything they can do with that site specific eczema? Yeah, I feel, I feel your pain. That is one of the more challenging areas and it's one of the more uncomfortable areas. Um, we're dealing with our hands all day and as we get into this time of the year where humidity goes down and moisture goes down, guess what, um, hand eczema, it, it can and is often a sign of atopic dermatitis. Uh, the classic teaching was if you had eczema as a child, oftentimes into adulthood, it moved towards the hands. It's not always the case. How do you know if hand eczema is contact allergy, meaning whatever touches your skin, that patch testing we talked about, you're allergic to. Telltale signs might be, one, you start to see it on the back of the hand, the top of the hand, as opposed to the palm side of the hand. When you see it on the back of the hand, that's a sign also more of contact allergy. What else might tell you? When you actually put the medication on, whatever you're using, you can actually develop, you can actually be allergic to that medicine. You can, believe it or not, be allergic to topical steroids. Two to three percent of patients are allergic to their topical steroid. So if you notice when you apply the medicine or the moisturizer, it actually aggravates it. Suspect that that may be contact allergy as well, particularly for the hands. Quick tip, the hands, particularly around the cuticles, get really dry and cracked. The heels on the feet as well get very cracked and deep fissures. It's almost impossible to cure those right away best thing to do truly is to take super glue if you're not allergic to the acrylic glue and put a super glue into those cracks and now creates a bridge to block that deep fissure or crack and now you can start to put the moisturizers on and everything you need and it helps to prevent the bacteria and other things irritants from getting deeper into the skin so the answer we don't always know bring it up to your doctor hey how do i know this isn't contact dermatitis and then it may need patch testing and so forth. So great question. We don't always know, but we have ways to figure it out. And if they've had um, hand eczema for some time, should they be concerned that it's likely to spread to other parts of the body? Yeah, there's not a really good way to know. It's, it's generally found that if you have hand eczema, 
that seems to be the isolated hand and feet area that it sticks to. Um, so there's no hard and fast rule, so it's hard to predict. One last thing I have noticed, and most docs have noticed, there's a correlation. If you have hand foot eczema, there is a higher percentage of people who smoke with hand foot eczema. So if you notice that, pay attention. If you're a smoker, it's one motivator that might help you reduce smoking or stop. And then if you try it, you might be interested to find out that your eczema will quietly go away once you eliminate cigarette smoking. Huh. Well, since you mentioned smoke, will smoke from a fireplace or campfire um, irritate the same way as a cigarette? Smoke will? Yeah, you, it can, and that's going to be an individual thing. There's individual variability. So for some people, it can. And then there's that second component, remember, the thermal effect. Remember we talked about heat. So anything heat, most people with eczema, heat aggravates. So therefore, that thermal heat coming off the campfire, God, it feels wonderful. The, the fireplace, it feels wonderful, but it also, that heat can also help set off more eczema. So it's a cause and effect. Find out the individual variability. If it works for you, keep doing it. If it sets you off, unfortunately, it's something to avoid. Uh -huh. Can you talk a little bit about scalp eczema? I know that can take you into other types often, but maybe um, a little a little bit about what that is and, and how to treat it. Sure. Scalp eczema is, there are a lot of different names. You can have atopic dermatitis with the eczema with, uh, in the scalp, miserable. You can have what's called seborrheic dermatitis or seborrheic eczema, what we would commonly call dandruff with redness and flaking in the scalp and itching. So a lot of different forms of eczema in the scalp. Scalp is one particular area that tends to be played into by stress. It's one of those unconscious things that if you notice while you're working at the computer or, or studying or whatever you're doing, you go up and you don't even realize that you're scratching. So it's that same itch mechanism. And this is where it's one of the worst areas, that as you itch the scalp or scratch the scalp, it creates more itching and you start to notice that the area gets thicker, flakier, and as it starts, that starts to happen, um, you get into a horrible cycle. So ways quickly to help with it. One, recognize that if you can do anything to eliminate scratching, whether it's ice cubes, lotions with menthol, that will help. Um, shampoo, this is one of the ones where you do want to shampoo on a daily basis. The ingredients in the shampoos that you look for. One, zinc pyrothione, so zinc. And you have to look for it. Head and Shoulders is a brand name people know, but you have to look for the head and shoulders that has zinc in it. So look for any of the brands that have zinc, P-Y-R-T-H-I-O-N-E. Very good at calming down the redness and helping the excessive flaking. You may want to look for one that has salicylic acid. Neutrogena t sal is one brand. Those are actually helping to reduce the excessive flaking. So you get too much scabbing and flaking going on. One of my favorites when it gets really aggravated and it's too thick in the scalp, I like something called P as in Paul and S as in Sam, P and S solution. Leave it in, it's over the counter. You can do it yourself. Leave it in overnight in your scalp. Use P and S shampoo to rinse it out. Other shampoos that are effective over the counter, Ketoconazole or Nizoral 1% shampoo reduces yeast counts in the scalp, which actually help as well. Then, obviously, you can get prescription shampoos, which have high uh, or very concentrated topical steroids. Helps reduce itching very, very quickly. And then you want to look for, at that point, if you can't handle it over the counter on your own, go to your topical steroids and the topical immune modulators. And this is the one where you don't want to use the ornaments or crease. Um, you want to look for preparations that are solutions, sprays, or even foams. They tend to penetrate and not mess up your hair quite as much. So you're going to start with a topical approach. Certainly there's even things, by the way, one of the pearls, there is a therapy that we carry in the office and a lot of dermatologists carry. It's called the extract or pharaoh's laser. It is a little wand 
that we can actually place directly into the scalp of our affected eczema. And it's a light treatment. It's phototherapy that is directed right into the scalp. So again, we can escalate up depending on the severity, but I, I feel for you if you have it, it's miserable and it's a regular battle. Just because you're using a prescription or a medicated shampoo doesn't mean you don't use conditioner. You still want to be using a conditioner to help moisturize as well. Great. You'd mentioned bleach baths in your presentation. For those with scalp um, eczema, should they submerge their head in the bleach bath? Absolutely. Um, I understand your trepidation to do that, um, but just close your eyes. Think of it as no different than diving into a swimming pool with chlorine. It's the same type of effect. So yes, your scalp, your face, have colonized with staph, get infected, put it underneath the water. And in fact, for those people that have colored hair, it's not going to affect your colored hair as well. So it is a very, it's highly recommended. Put your head, face under the water briefly. Um, it, it's calming and actually makes it better. Great. Um, I'll go with two more questions here and then we'll close it down for the night. We have a question. Someone um, used topical steroids for two months and then their AD seemed worse. Is this a rebound effect? So I'm not sure I caught that. So they used, uh, repeat it again? A topical steroid for two months and then uh, their eczema seemed worse. Is that a rebound effect? That's a rebound effect. So there's two things that can happen. One, remember I talked about when you use a topical steroid, it constricts the little capillaries and blood vessels so the itchy chemical can't leak out into the skin. What happens is as you stop using them, eventually those capillaries start to dilate back again, and therefore it explains why there's a, a, not a cure, but the eczema starts happening back again. So that's why I don't look at topical steroids as the long-term solution. They're more of a short-term stop the itch. There's a second phenomenon called tachyphylaxis, and all that means is if you use the highest potency day in and day out, your body gets will get accustomed to it and develop resistance to it, and it stops working. And that would be almost another effect of you start to use the medicine, you start to see a rebound effect of it just stops working on you. The last one, just to remember, it, it happens. It happens more with patients with eczema. Um, you can have a topical steroid allergy. So a lot of people use triamcinolone and different things. I'm going to tell you, you will be surprised, 3% of the time people are allergic to their topical steroids. So the exact thing you've been prescribed to make it better is actually making it worse at times. That's when you need the pet patch testing or allergy testing. So if they suspect that's the case, they should ask their doctor for patch testing. Exactly. Great. Um, let's see. Let's finish off with um, treatment for face eczema, eyes specifically, but face in general, because that can be a little different than the rest of the body. Absolutely. So Think of the facial skin as being a little bit more thin, particularly eyelid skin. So the easiest, we'll start with the eyelids, because remember we talked at the beginning, there's a propensity for people with eczema to have involvement of the eyelids. Easiest thing to do, my favorite thing to do for eyelids at nighttime, use Vaseline on your eyelids, upper lower eyelids. Vaseline can safely get into your eyes. It is the most cost-effective and calming thing you can do, um, and it's moisturizing. Remember, it's sealing in moisture. So if you've got your skin wet, seal it with Vaseline. Eyelid works beautifully. If, you are having, if you're not having problems with acne, then you can use mild topical steroids on the face. Seal it in with moisturizer. You want to use a lower strength. If you are prone to acne, so what ends up happening is topical steroids can actually make you break out more. So particularly around the mouth, in fact, in women, it's what we call perioral dermatitis. It's that combination of an eczema rash and pimple bumps at the same time. So now the double curse. 
you're an adult <laughs> or a teenager and you've got a rash and pimples at the same time. That's when you want to go with those medicines with the non-steroidal. You want to go with the protopic, the Elodil or Eucrisa. They won't cause acne and they're extraordinarily safe to use on the face. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for a phenomenal presentation. Thank you. Uh, you can find many additional resources about what you need to know when you're newly diagnosed with atopic dermatitis on our website at nationaleczema.org. And with that, we thank you so much, Dr. Teller. You did such a phenomenal job, and thanks for hanging in there with us a little late. And um, as I mentioned before, this has been recorded and will be posted and sent to all attendees and registrants within a week. And we thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful night. Thanks for having me. Thank you, guys.